thank you so much for worshiping online with us here at New Hope. We just want to take this moment to give you an opportunity for prayer. We believe that God is not limited by time or space and that wherever or whenever you're watching, God can move on your behalf. You can visit EuniceChurch.com, click on the prayer tab, and fill out the prayer request form that goes directly to our staff and to our prayer team where we can join our faith with yours and see God move in your situation. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you with all of our needs. We thank you that you listen to us and that you move on our behalf and that you care about the things that we care about. God, I pray that in every situation you would move right now, wherever they are, whenever they're praying. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen.
take full advantage of this opportunity that we have right now. The opportunity to engage in prayer. We had that opportunity for, for us to be able to pray with you or for you. And now I want to ask for you to pray with us, with me. In other words, I want to challenge you, maybe for the first time ever, not to just listen to me pray right now but for you to open your mouth and to use your words for us to speak life and light in the midst of death and darkness on this freedom weekend. And and listen, I unapologetically am proud to number one, have been born even in, in North Louisiana, which is still Louisiana, no matter what you say. Number two, to be have been born a citizen of the United States of America. I'm very grateful to have been born and raised in this nation. And yet at the same time, I am very concerned that my children were born in this nation. Not that there's anywhere else that I would rather them be, but just in the world, period. I believe that the word of God is only as powerful as it is proclaimed. And so right now, I want to invite the people of God to proclaim the Word of God. See, when the Spirit of the Lord spoke into the author of the Scripture and said, where my presence is, there is freedom, he didn't say anything about a system. He didn't say anything about politics. He didn't say anything about democracy. In fact, I know this is going to be a little bit offensive, but when Jesus returns, he's not establishing a democracy. We will rule and reign with Jesus. It won't be for the people or by the people. It will be for the people because of the king of the people. And he is the one upon which we call right now to fix only, to heal only, to purpose only. Come on, let's pray. Father, right now we partner, uniting our faith together. We lift up this nation to you, the United States of America, no matter where it's been or what it was built upon. God, I don't pray that we would turn back to you. I pray that we would turn truly to you. I don't pray that what has been would be again. I pray that the best days of the United States of America would be ahead because the people of God are proclaiming the word of God and the gospel rule and reigns upon this land. I pray that the voice of the Holy Spirit would be the loudest voice on social media, the loudest voice in Congress, the loudest voice in the White House, the loudest voice in mainstream media. Let your spirit be the reason that we stand in freedom for where your spirit is and only your spirit is, there is freedom. Pray in Jesus name that you would heal our land by your blood and because you came we stand in your substance your strength and your security today we worship and we say as the church here I am God send me use me and let me be a part of bringing heaven to earth for such a time as this in Jesus name come on sing it one more time say Father, I thank you that the prayers of your people, the prayers of a remnant, God, that if when Moses prayed, you changed your mind, if when Amos prayed, you changed your mind, if when Hezekiah prayed, you sent 80,000 angels to do the bidding and do the work on your behalf, if when Isaiah prayed for Hezekiah, you extended his life, I pray, God, that because your people pray in such a time as this for the state of our nation as the whole world is attempting to bowl over, I pray that we would be blown away by the power of God and the breath of your Holy Spirit. Would you rule and reign in our hearts, in our homes, and in our habitat? We give you this land. We give you this nation. We give you our children children and our children's children. God, you can have it all. Have your will. 
thank you that our prayers do not fall upon the ears of a deaf deity but they're received upon the heart of a holy heavenly father we love you we place our faith come on we place our trust in you no, no matter what happens around us no matter what's going on in society we stand and when we run out of strength to stand we stand in you in jesus name everybody said amen come on give god praise this morning Thank you again for joining us online. If you appreciate the ministry that goes on here at New Hope, we want to remind you of several different ways that you can worship God with your giving. Number one, you can text to give. All you have to do is enter in the amount that you would like to send and text it to 84321. The second way you can give is go to our website to unischurch.com and click on the giving tab and follow the instructions from there. And finally, you can give by mailing it to the address here at New Hope, 865 Satig Road, right here in Eunice. Or you can stop by during our office hours. Thank you again for worshiping God with your giving. Hey, good evening, and thank you for joining us for this online-only edition of this weekend service. We are in a brand new series this week called Lead Me. Today, I want to talk about leading yourself. Nobody can lead you like you. Nobody can pray for you like you. In fact, we're going to even take a term this series and try to transition it into taking more ownership and responsibility for pastoring ourselves. Often people have asked me, hey, would you pray for me? To which I would always respond, yes. But in this series, I want to encourage you, don't just ask people to pray for you. Ask people to pray with you. Hey, if you are at high risk during this time of being concerned over infectious disease, over illness, over viruses, and you can't be in service, if you have a compromised immune system, or if your doctor just recommends that you not gather in large groups, this service is for you. Lead me. Today we're talking about leading yourself. I want to go back to 2007. Not very far back for some people. Uh, and for me, it feels like it's further than it actually was. Or maybe it's the opposite of that. It went by really quickly. 2007, I just graduated college. Um, I've been there for five years. Yeah, I stretched that out. Most people, the average person can do college in four years. But I like to live above the averages. I did it in five. And in 2007... I uh, was able to go and play baseball for the Astros organization for just a year and a half. I really wasn't that great, but it was a great opportunity. I'll fast forward and skip some of those gory details there. I had a great time. I went to the next year. I came into spring training in 2008 and played the best baseball of my entire life. I mean, Four years of high school, five years of college, the best baseball I'd ever played in my life. I was on base more than I was out. I was hitting like I wanted to. I was making plays in the outfield, throwing people out. It was the best baseball, the best month of baseball I'd ever played. At the end of that month, uh, my name wasn't on any of the rosters to go out of spring training to go to high single A, low single A, or certainly double A or triple A. I wouldn't have made it there anyways, but I thought at least I would be on one of those. I was on none. I called my uncle, who was also drafted by the Expos back in the 80s because he's way older than me, and uh, I called him, and he encouraged me, don't quit, because if you quit, you'll never know what could have been, and so I stayed. I stayed through for about another month and a half, 
in uh, baseball purgatory, essentially. It's called extended spring training. It's the in-between, the short season and uh, the seasons and the people that are already out playing. And so I was there for about a month and a half. And after about a month and a half of that, uh, we had played a game. I actually think I got a hit that day. It, it wasn't a bad day. I was just sitting in the dugout. And uh, I finally, I think I finally prayed. And I said, God, thank you for this incredible opportunity. Man, I've, I've had a blast. I knew it was only because of him that I was there because I really, I wasn't the guy that was supposed to be able to play at that level. It just, it, it was a God thing. It was a God opportunity for me. And so I was thanking him. Hey, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to play at this level, to compete at this level, to be here. But God, if Major League Baseball is not how I'm going to provide for my family, then I've had enough of this dream. I'm ready to go home and get started on whatever it is that you have for me. Um, I had the opportunity this Saturday to preach to some students at Northside Christian, the seniors at Northside, and, and I asked the Lord, um, what would you have me say? What can I say that I wish somebody would have said to me? And one of the phrases that God gave me was, he's not nearly as interested in my dreams for my life as he is his destiny for my life. And so I said, God, I've had enough of this dream. I'm ready to go get prepared and started on whatever it is that you have for me. I was there for one more day. And on that Friday morning, the clubhouse manager came in and said, hey, Skipper wants to see you, which means pack your stuff because your meeting with Skip is not going to go well. So I went and we met and sat down and I gathered my things and, and I got in my truck and I began to drive home. And my wife wants me to tell you this part of the story. I was driving. I was so ready to be home. I was so over extended spring training. I didn't know if I even cared to play baseball anymore. I was 24 years old. I was getting married in October. I sensed that God was calling me to something different than continuing to strive in that area, in the area of the game or even coaching. I, I sensed the stirring and man, I was praying and I was talking on the phone and I was ready to see my fiance. I was ready to be home and I was driving from Florida to Louisiana. So that would be Florida to Alabama to Mississippi and up and over into North Louisiana. And man, I was on my way until I looked up and saw a sign that said, Welcome to Georgia. The only problem was I wasn't going to Georgia. Y'all, I had driven an hour, an hour in the wrong direction. I pulled off. Got out at a gas station, opened up a map because my Blackberry at the time didn't have GPS. I got a map to try to figure out where in the world I was. I spent another two hours trying to get back down to the interstate. And I was talking to my dad. I was so frustrated. I was talking to my fiance. I was so frustrated. I've wasted a day. I'm not going to get home today. I pulled over in the scariest, sketchiest looking motel that you could find. I paid like $42.99 for a room that night. I put my stuff in the room, pulled the covers back, and laid down in my clothes on the bed. Went to sleep, got up early, and drove all the way home the next day. A little side note. When I got back on the interstate, when I got back on I-10 around Tallahassee, I looked back and there was smoke coming up from the median. Apparently, with just within a couple of hours, there had been an 18-wheeler turn, turn over and a fire had started. Now, I don't know for a fact that I missed that accident. I don't know for a fact that that happened at the exact time that I would have been coming through there. But I just sensed in my spirit that I was supposed to thank God for the accident that I missed. See, I thought that I had gotten distracted and been led astray and it had cost me time. But what the enemy meant for evil, 
Come on, God was using for the good. And God, I believe, was protecting me from things that I didn't even need know I needed to be protected from because I was just praising him and praying to him and l- being led by him. Even though I thought I was being led in the wrong direction, I was actually being led by him. I got home and I was there for one day, like one day. Went to sleep that night, woke up the next morning. <laughs> and I was telling my, my stepdad this story earlier this week. I was like, man, I was just writing about you. I was there for one day. I woke up the next morning and I was, I was watching TV. I think Megan was on the way over. I hadn't seen her in several months. And she was coming to see me. And, and we were going to hang out and spend a day together. And, and my stepdad's getting ready for work. He's doing some stuff. And he goes, hey, what you going to do? And I was like. I mean, Megan's on the way over here, and we're going to do something today, hang out today. He's like, no, no, no. What you going to do this summer? Like, what you going to do? Like, you, Because you're not just going to sleep in, stay here, and eat my food, and not work. You're going to do something. And I was like, hey, Tim, I, I, I've been home. I ain't even been home 24 hours yet. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just got released by the Houston Astros. Like, my whole world's kind of, he's like, what's that got to do with what you're doing all day? What's that got to do with you working? You're not just going to live here and hang out. You need to figure out what you're going to do. And I was like, man, okay. okay. And he wasn't. Now, look, being a father now and a daddy now, like, I get it. <laughs> like, we're not going to lay around and pout. Like, it's time to get moving. We got to get going. So I raised this question as we go into this series called Lead Me, and we discuss leading yourself. I don't think that any of us think it's okay for a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old to just settle in and be satisfied with living in somebody else's house, eating somebody else's food, Being content with the effort of other people and not desiring to invest on their own. Just kind of settling in right there and deciding, you know, I just don't want to grow up. This is as far as I want to go. This is as far as I want to grow. So my question as we go into this series is, why does it seem to be acceptable not to grow up as a Christian? Why does it seem acceptable For a Christian's main course to be prepared by somebody else. For a Christian's food to be served by somebody else. For them to be perfectly content, for us to be perfectly content, just kind of hanging out and and hoping God will mold us and hoping God will grow us and hoping somebody else will protect us and hoping somebody else will feed us. At what point is it no longer okay for a five-year-old Christian to continue to act like a newborn? (laughs) <laughs> That's where we're going in this series. At what point is it no longer okay for a 15-year-old Christian to continue to act like an adolescent? At what point is it no longer okay for a 20 or a 25-year-old Christian to continue to act like a teenager Christian? At what point do we ever arrive in our walk with Jesus and go, you know what, I'm good right here. I don't want to go any further. I don't want to grow any more. Some, some people are completely satisfied with just receiving salvation and then never growing. I know people that have claimed to have been born and raised. That's their claim. In God's house, around God's people, in the church. I was born, I was born and raised in the church. I was saved at an early age, and they've been a Christian for almost as, as long as they've been alive. I mean, like, they received salvation at a very early age, and yet they still have never grown to the point where they carry the responsibility of feeding themselves, serving others, being led by Jesus, and leading others to serve him as well. They're just completely satisfied with just being saved. And I'm not sure that the Savior is okay with us being so satisfied with our own salvation. Psalm 61 verse 2 says it this way, From the ends of the earth 
I call out to you whenever my heart is faint. Watch this. This is our series scripture. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We will never arrive to the place that Jesus stands in this life. There is always more to learn. There is always more to grow. You know what we found over COVID-19 is that we really weren't doing a great job as a church teaching you how to pastor yourself, teaching you how to pastor your spouse, teaching you how to pastor your home, your children, your family, your friends. And certainly, we, I don't know that we were doing a great job. I think we were on the way, but I don't know that we were doing a great job of teaching people how to pastor this community. Because what we found is when we, the, the large group gatherings were taken away, some people were starving to death because it was their only meal. Instead of a supplement... To gathering instead of a celebration of all the ministry being done by all the saints, this was the ministry. And I'm not sure that that's God's will for us. You know why it seems acceptable for a five year old Christian to act like a newborn? Because we're not leading and being led, we've become satisfied with not seeing people saved. With not doing the work of an evangelist. We're not leading and being led. Hey, if you're taking notes with me, let's keep going. Get on track and stay there. Number one, God called me to be led. God called me to be led. Jesus converted people with two words. His conversion method was two words. Follow me. We were created to be led. We are, um, we are called. I keep saying created. We are called to be led by Jesus. Jesus' calling for conversion was follow me. These two simple words. And it, this is going to get a little heavy in this series. Come on. Because this is July. And it's the dog days of summer. And this is when the church is honing and trimming and pruning in preparation for the influx of guests and visitors. And those that are going to be coming back to church in August and September. That's what we're gearing up for. But if we're going to be able to facilitate all of the people that God wants to send, we've got to be able able to follow him wherever he leads. And leadership is not lazy. See, I can't follow Jesus and be lazy. Those two things do not go hand in hand. But the sad truth is that churches in the vast majority, Christians, evangelistic preachers, not really known for our work ethic. We're more known for our words than our work ethic. Predominantly, we're just not known for our effort and our investment. Although Jesus was, because that's all he did. So the Savior that we say we believe in was known not just for his words but for his works. But we seem to be more satisfied with words than we are works. I'm told you, like, this is going to be a little tough. Like, this is leadership. And we have to grow. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 says it this way. Take a lesson. Take a lesson from the ants. <laughs> you lazy. Oh, okay, so English Standard Version and King James and New King James and NIV. I think most of them, they say, oh, sluggard. <laughs> New Living Translation says, you lazy bones. That's, my, that's basically what my daddy was saying to me. That my daddy, since I was four years old, daddy Tim's looking at me and saying, hey boy, <laughs> like I know you're upset, but you've been home 24 hours. You can stay here and lick your wounds and, and have your pity party, or you can get up and figure out what God wants you to do. Take a lesson from the ant, lazy bones. <laughs> Learn from their ways. 
and be wise. The next two verses basically say, and I don't have them in here, but the next two verses basically say, the ants don't need a king, the ants don't need a ruler, the ants don't need somebody forcing them to work and store up food for their winter. Take a lesson from this ethic that an ant has to work. Verse 9, but you, lazy bones, <laughs> it's such a fun word. How long will you sleep? When will you wake? I believe this is a prophetic message for the church. I believe that this right here is a prophetic message for the church right now. The church that can't gather the way that it wants to. The church that can't have services the way that it wants to. The church that can't celebrate and just come together the way that it wants to. And have, I believe this is a prophetic message. How long will you sleep? When will you wake up? Verse 10, a little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Verse 11, and poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Looking around at what's going on in the world, Blaming everything and everybody else for what's not so great. Look, the church doesn't have time to play the blame game. God's people don't have time to point fingers. And we also don't just get to pray and sit on our spiritual morals. No, no, no. This is the time to rise up. To wake up. And to do what God has called us to do. Poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. And scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. See, laziness and leadership can't coexist. Laziness and being led by Jesus can't coexist. God will do the work that you can't do. But he's not going to do the work that you can do. He's a perfectly holy, heavenly father. And a good daddy doesn't spoil his children rotten and enable them to continue on in a direction that he doesn't have for them. Write this down if you're taking notes. My spiritual health is my responsibility. My spiritual health is my responsibility. For those of you that have a great work ethic, and man, you work hard. I mean, you're an, you're an eight to seven guy or, or lady. And I know people that way. I know people that put 40, 50, 55, 60 hours a week in and still try to come up here and serve their face off and love and live for Jesus. My question is, why do we not take the same ethic that we have for temporary things, the same expectation that we have for temporary solutions and apply that to our spiritual health. See, it's funny to me that nobody knows how to read the Bible. Man, I just don't know where to start. I just don't know where to begin. But Facebook's not trying to convince anybody where they should start on their scrolling or on their news feed. Like, Facebook's not putting out training video. No, we figure out what we want to figure out. But all of a sudden, when it comes to God's Word, man, I just don't really know how to get into Scripture. Or, or I just don't like reading, man. I just don't like reading. But you done read 17 posts in the last 15 minutes. But you don't have time to read God's Word. That's the generation that we're in. I got time to read the newspaper. I got time to watch mainstream. I got time to get frustrated by everybody's stuff. But I don't have time to read God's Word. I just don't like to read, man. No, no, no. You don't like to read what you don't want to read. My spiritual health is my responsibility. I'll never forget a great friend and mentor, Pastor Johnny Hunt, just here this past week to preach to our students. Um, he said this to me one time early on. I believe it was around 2008 or so. He said, man, it, it just surprises me. Like, as hard as you work out and, and as hard as you train, how much discipline you have to, like, to, to get ready for a game and to, to prepare mentally, that you don't take that same discipline and, and apply it to your, to your spiritual health, to your relationship with Jesus. Like all of a sudden, when it comes to 
um, simple disciplines in Christianity or, or, or denying your flesh in this area or your desires in this area, all of a sudden you, you have this great discipline over here for preparing and training and growing and, and getting bigger and stronger and faster and better, but all of a sudden, for some reason, that discipline doesn't convert to Christianity. That discipline doesn't convert to your relationship with Jesus. My spiritual health is my responsibility. Number two, and this is where we'll begin to land the plane. God created me to lead. He called me to be led. Because you can't lead if you don't know how to be led. See, the best leader is always an incredible follower. But it's a follower, that leader is a follower, he or she is a follower of the right things and the right people. God called me. Jesus' plan for conversion was follow me. But God created me to lead. Like, it's in my DNA. He created me to do it. Otherwise, he couldn't hold me accountable to it. In Matthew 25, there's this parable of the talents and Jesus tells this story of the master giving some talents away, giving some treasure away. Now, we, know, we understand that heaven's treasure is always people. Heaven's treasure is conversions into the kingdom. Heaven's treasure is disciples making disciples. That is heaven's treasure. Like, that is the currency of the kingdom of God, is people and heaven's treasure. And so Jesus tells, with that in mind, Jesus tells this story of a master giving a servant five talents and another servant two talents and another servant one talent. And, the, and, the, and the, the servant with five talents, he went out and he invested it and he doubled his investment. That disciple made more disciples. What Jesus gave him, the master, what the master Jesus gave him, he went out and used for the sake of the kingdom of God. He served, he shared, he ministered, he, he was led, and he decided to lead, and he doubled the master's investment. He brought as many back in as the master had given to him. And the, the servant that had two talents, he did the same thing. Even though he wasn't as charismatic, even though he wasn't as popular, even though his platform wasn't as big, even though he didn't have as many social media followers, he did with what God gave him what he was supposed to do. He had two talents. He just wasn't quite as good as the other guy. He didn't have as much talent as the other guy. He didn't have as much resource as the other guy. But what Jesus gave to him, he did his best with. He took responsibility responsibility for his spiritual health because he understood that he was called to, to be led and created to lead. So he took the two and he doubled that. And then the final one, he just had one, not a whole lot to him, you know, a little slow, didn't feel very secure about himself, just kind of satisfied with his, his gift from the master. Thank you for saving me. Just that one thing, man, I'm just Whew, I'm just glad to be called a servant. Not going to do a whole lot. Not going to lead a whole lot. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this salvation that Jesus has given me. I'm going to bury it until he comes back. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I see in this story. If I'm wrong, then so be it. But I see in this story. So here comes the master. And to the servant who had five talents and doubled them, he says, well done. Good and faithful servant. To the servant with two talents, he says, well done. Well done. You took what I gave you, and you did your best with it, and you let me take care of the rest. See, you do your best and let God take care of the rest. When we don't do our best, we'll give an account. We don't just get to rest to the one that just buried it in the yard, even though it was given See, that's why Jesus says, freely you received, freely give. Watch what he says to the last servant in verse 26 of Matthew 25. The master replies to him, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, verse 27. Why didn't you de just, just deposit my money in the bank? 
Like, just invite somebody to church, man. Just go pick somebody up and bring them with you. Just, just one person. Just focus on one person this year. Just invest in one person. Pray for one person. Co-lead a small group with just one person. Host it in your house. You don't even have to do anything, but pick up your living room and turn on your TV. Let somebody else come lead it. Just, 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 just deposit it somewhere. Just find somewhere to deposit. Just change one diaper. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the people that do that, by the way. Just, just deposit it somewhere. That's all you had to do. At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Like I could have I used that cup of water. I could have used that smile. I could have used that wave. I could have used your home. I could have used that place. But nothing happened. Verse 28, then he ordered, you know what? Just, just take the money from the servant. Give it to the one with ten bags. Verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. To those who use well... What they are given, even more will be given. More salvation, more sanctification, more infilling of the Holy Spirit. So we've taken what God wants to do in our lives and made it a selfish endeavor where we just hoard it up to continue to use it on ourselves to feel better about ourselves instead of expending ourselves and being poured out like a drink offering before our God. To who... Use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing. Like again, look, I know this is heavy. But this is a message to the people of God. This is a message to the believers. This is a message to the saints who claim to be saved. The joint heirs with Jesus. From those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So there's two types of leaders, self-serving or savior-serving. Self-serving or savior-serving. And by the way, the difference is the self-serving leader, leader, the one that's only interested in serving self. See, if you're serving yourself in order to serve somebody else, then that's a different story altogether. Because you can't lead people to places that you haven't been. You can't take somewhere Someone to somewhere that you're not familiar with. But if you're just hoarding up and it's all about you, it's all about me, 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 it's self serving. You're leading like Lucifer. And there are people in churches for years that just never grow. They never get any better. They never grow. They never go. They never do a whole lot. They just, they give what they're supposed to and they're even arrogant about that. It's self serving. It's all about me. Or your Savior serving. We're serving our Savior. There's a podcast that I would invite you to listen to. It's called Lead Like Jesus. Podcast. I'm sure there's some YouTube videos. See, a Savior-serving individual doesn't just receive, but gives. And leads like Jesus. And you may be thinking, well, Chris, I'm not a leader. I'm about to prove you wrong. Listen, just because you don't realize something doesn't mean it's not true. Just because you don't realize what's in you doesn't mean that it's not in you. See, you may see a seed, I see a field. And when you see a field, I see an orchard. When you see an orchard, I see another seed. And we just continue to plant and we continue to water and God continues to bring a harvest. Well, Chris, I'm not a leader. Leaders are born or leaders are made or both. Are they born or are they made? That's a great question. What's the difference between a leader and a follower? Or what's the difference between somebody that looks like a leader and somebody that doesn't look like they lead anything or anybody? I believe it's just the perspective of the individual. See, I believe that leadership, very simply, is just influence. And every single one of us have influence with somebody. That's all leadership is. Anybody that has influence with somebody is a leader. If somebody has influence with anybody, <laughs> they're a leader. 
And you have influence. I have influence. You're like, well, yeah, you have influence. You're the preacher of a church. Yeah, but you have influence. There's somebody watching you. There's somebody listening to you. There's somebody that reads your comments. There's somebody looking at what you post, looking at what you like. You have, you have influence. The question is, are we using that influence for the sake of the kingdom? To serve him? Or are we using that influence to serve ourselves? Last scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Are leaders born or made? I believe the answer is yes. I believe the answer is yes to that question. We're born and we're made. I believe that we were cre- called, called to be led. But I believe that we were created to lead. And I'm going to prove it as a, as a first law, first mention law in, in the first chapter of Genesis. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now that's what Jesus came to redeem. We, we lost, we gave the image and likeness over to the enemy. Every time that we choose our flesh, we give that image and likeness. Every time that we choose ourself, we give that image and likeness. Every time that we choose our desire, every time that we respond emotionally, every time that we react irrationally, every time that we say no to our master, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm not ready for that. Every time we say, I don't like to read scripture. Well, I like to read Facebook posts, but I don't like to read scripture. Every time that we're dishonorable, the list goes on and on. We give that likeness and we give that image away. God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness. There's an imago day inside of you. There's an image of God inside of you. There's a seed of potential that could burst into a river of life inside of you. Verse 27, I believe, 28, jump to 28. And God blessed them, the creation. God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Listen to me as we close today. Leadership is in your DNA. God invested his image into your DNA. And then if that wasn't enough... In the Hebrew, he said, I want you to subdue. I want you to bring into bondage. Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and bring it into bondage. In other words, you are not subject to the earth. The earth is subject to you if you understand whose you are and the identity inside of you. Subdue it. Kadash. Overcome it. Bring it into bondage. And if that weren't enough, don't just bring it into bondage. Like, don't just trap it. Now tell it what to do. Rada, rule, reign, have dominion, and dominate. Leadership is in your DNA. Leadership is who you were created to be. You were called to be led by Jesus and Jesus alone. You weren't called to be led by mainstream media. You weren't called to be led by mantras or the lack of mantras. You weren't called to be led by agendas or agenda-driven people. You were called to be led by Jesus and you were created to lead other people to him. There is a kadash inside of you that could cause subduction and bondage bondage in trapping the things that are not of the kingdom of God and then there is a rada spoken into your existence where you are to rule and reign for and in Jesus name even right now here on earth you don't just trap and you don't just stop you talk and you start that is who we are if God is in us then so is his image it's ingrained in our creation and it's who he called us to be to lead me and understand that the most important person that I lead is myself because I can't lead others 
if I'm not being led by him. And I can't lead others if I'm not leading myself. If my spiritual health is not my responsibility. Come on, would you bow your head and pray with me today? Lord, I thank you that you're not done. You're just getting started. I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose. That your conversion plan is follow me. And there's never a point where you say, okay, that's far enough. Lord, let us as the church wake up. Let us as the church rise up. Let us as the church speak up and say the right things. Let us as the church serve up. Lord, help us to answer the call to be led by you. And God, help us to walk in our identity, our creative identity to lead Lead me into places even higher than I currently am being led. And Father, finally this morning, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, whenever you're listening, if you need to give your life to Jesus today, see, you'll never be the leader till you learn how to be the follower. His plan of conversion is very simple. Follow me. He just wants you. He wants you to surrender. He wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to be free. He wants you to grow and become more like him, not just better versions of yourself, but transformed and made new. If that's you right now, I want to invite you to open your hands right where you are. Right where you are, pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me. Where I've fallen short, Where I didn't answer the call, where I got distracted, where I've been selfish. Cleanse me. Save me. I believe you died on the cross for all of those things. You paid the price for me to have relationship with you. You were raised from the dead so that I could live with, in, And through you, from now into eternity, take my life. Jesus, take my life and make it yours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, we want to connect with you. We want to send you some resource. We want to partner with you. We want to know what God is doing in your life. Text right now. I believe to 84576. I believe, all one word, very simple, to 84576 so we can follow up and help you continue and take the next steps in Jesus. We love you and we thank you for listening and tuning in today. God bless you. Stay tuned real quick for a short message. Hey, before you go, if you just committed or recommitted your life to Jesus, we want to direct you to our website, EuniceChurch.com. You can fill out a connect card or a prayer request right there on the front of our page. And we have a team standing by that want to connect with you and celebrate with you and pray for you for whatever is going on in your life. We are so excited about what God is doing. Listen, as we close today, I want to pray a blessing over you as we go. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon them and be gracious to them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. Holy Spirit, I ask, God, that you would anoint us to accomplish your will, walk in your ways, and achieve the vision that you have given this house here at New Hope, and that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.